And then we have Brother Ahmad Didat, our eminent scholar of the Bible and the Quran. He'll be one of our speakers this evening. And next to him on the far side, we have Mr. Paul Findlay, the author of the book that was available in the foyer. Mr. Paul Finley was a congressman in the United States of America for about 22 years. But you can see he's quite a handsome guy. And his wife wouldn't allow him to come to South Africa alone. We welcome you also, Mrs. Finley, seated right in front. May you enjoy the hospitality of Cape Town. Thank you. Our program for this evening will be the following. We have two speakers. The first one will be Mr. Paul Findlay. And thereafter, Mr. Ahmad Didat. And both of them will address the topic in their own way is Israel set up for destruction? At the end of Mr. Didat's talk, we welcome questions from anybody with one provision, that the question must pertain to the topic under discussion tonight. It might seem to you that I have a pleasant seat right up front, but I do believe that the success of this evening to a very large degree depends on you and on me. I request you to come up to the front and put questions. Please, this is not a debate, and you cannot come up and either debate or give another lecture. I will then be compelled to rule you out of order, and with respect to you, I would like to say it matters not who you are. If we can't control the thing from the front, then there's no sense in having the proceedings of this evening. So if I stop you, it is the way I see it in the interest of this evening. I now have great pleasure in calling upon our first speaker for the evening, Mr. Paul Finley. Thank you, Dr. Baker. I began this evening hoping to shake hands and meet personally every one of you but I didn't get very far. What a wonderful audience here tonight. Now, would, would those who can hear my words raise your hand so I can see them? Would you raise your hands if you can hear me? I can uh, be heard, I guess, up in the upper balcony too, is that true? Raise your hand if you can hear me up there. Good. That's reassuring. And while you have your hands up, I'll shake hands with each of you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Mrs. Finley and I have had a glorious time in South Africa. We've encountered something a little bit unusual, though. Several people have said that we talk funny. Now here we thought it was South Africans who talk funny. Now, if my talk is so funny that you can't understand it, Dr. Didot has promised that he will give you an English language translation of my remarks when I finish. <laughs> now, you, you met Mrs. Finley just a moment ago She's a very important person, very important to me personally, but also important to you tonight. She's my timekeeper. She makes sure that I don't talk too long. If I begin to talk too long, she raises her 
left arm up to listen to the watch to make sure it's still running. And then if that doesn't work, she stands up and walks out of the room. So you can see she fills a very important function tonight as my timekeeper. Lucille, would you stand up and say hello to the gathering? Thank you. Now I also want to thank the Cape Town Argus and the Cape Times. I've been reading about myself in both the Argus and the Times. Maybe some of you saw the same advertising that, that I saw. They described me in the ad advertising as Arafat's Whoops, things are changing here. This is an unrehearsed part of the program. <laughs> now, is that better? Can you hear me better now? How about up in the balcony? Now, does that come through better? It sounds to me much better. But I promise you I won't start over. <laughs> I want to thank... Um, the Cape Town Argus and the Cape Times for advertising my presence here in Cape Town. Otherwise, the public would never have known that Mrs. Finley and I are here. Now, in the advertising, they described me and quoted me as saying that I'm Yasser Arafat's only friend in the U.S. Congress. Well, I want you to know that I regard Chairman Yasser Arafat, who is now President Yasser Arafat of the New Palestine, as one of the great political figures of this generation. And I am very proud to be known as his friend. And I thank the Times and the Argus for advertising that fact. They also say that I am a former paid employee of the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee. That's a, an organization based in Washington, D.C. Well, for a time, I was paid by this organization, and I want you to know that any time I have the opportunity to work for an organization that works against racial discrimination, I will take great pride in having that job. And then in big letters, in big letters they say, ex-Congressman Paul Finley defeated in 1982. Well, I was not returned to Congress, but by my measure, I was not defeated. I was victorious because I am now given this great audience in South Africa that never would have been mine had I been returned to the Congress. So I thank the newspapers for this publicity. Now, there is some talk about this being a boxing match between myself and Ahmed Didat. And I checked around the stores to find, see if I could find the right boxing gloves to wear tonight. I couldn't find any small enough for me or any large enough for Ahmed Didat. So we aren't going to box with each other. We're going to talk about the same subject. In fact, I am so grateful tonight that I am on the same side with Ahmed Didat. I never want to be on the other side of the fence. I never want to be in the opposition to Ahmed Didat. As I ponder the provocative topic of this symposium, Is Israel Set Up for Destruction? My thoughts keep returning to the appearance of an Israeli citizen recently in a small dining room on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Get the picture. His name is Israel Shahak. 
He is the speaker of the occasion. He is a professor at, of chemistry at Hebrew University. He is a Jew. In his audience are people who work for U.S. congressmen, a few former members of the Congress, former career diplomats of the United States, and others interested in the peace movement for the Middle East, perhaps 75 people in all. The speaker is ordinary in appearance, about my height. He has gray, wispy hair. He wears thick glasses. He speaks softly. The noise from the adjoining dining rooms make it very difficult for any of us to hear what he has to say but his words are well worth straining to hear. He is remarkable. He knows adversity and fear as do few people on earth. He is a survivor of one of Adolf Hitler's death camps for Jews, a survivor of the Holocaust, himself a Jew and in his words, a law-abiding citizen of Israel, no one will accuse him of being anti-Semitic. And as a survivor of the Holocaust, no one will accuse him of being indifferent to the suffering of Jews under Nazi Germany. He makes his living teaching chemistry, but his calling is decency in human relations. He warns against the destructive course of Israeli policy. He cries out with concern for the plight of the Palestinians, and he expresses anguish for the future of the land that he loves and wants to keep loving, the state of Israel. In another time, he would be a prophet, and the Christian Bible that Ahmadidat knows so well might well contain a new book, a book of Shahak. He's a modern-day prophet calling upon his own people in Israel to repent their sins against their neighbors, trying to awaken at the same time the people of the United States to the grim and awful truth about what is really happening inside the state of Israel. He expresses his warning and his anguish in Washington, D.C., which is just exactly the right place because the U.S. government is the lifeline for the state of Israel. Therefore, the people of America should know the reality of the Middle East because they must accept the blame, much of the blame, for what is happening in Israel because they are indeed the lifeline without which Israel could not survive. Prophet Shahak's usual weapon is the written word. Every month, he seeks out in the Hebrew language press of Israel facts about happenings within that state. He translates these into English and sends copies of the translation to a number of periodicals in the United States. This report is critically important because it reviews Israel's Hebrew press, not Israel's English press. It is the Hebrew press that describes reality in Israel. For one thing, the Hebrew press reports accurately what Prime Minister Shamir has to say. It tells the truth about Shamir's thoughts. Israel Shahak says, and I quote him, Shamir lies only in English, end of quote. That is to say, if you really want to know what is on Shamir's mind, listen to what he has to say in Hebrew. The English press in Israel is tailor-made for foreign consumption, designed mainly for the people of the United States to support and reinforce the powerful effect of Israel's lobby in the United States, where all that is good about Israel is emphasized and exaggerated and all that is evil is ignored or rationalized. In contrast, the Hebrew press in Israel tells it like it is. Each month, Israel Shahat seeks out and translates into English those portions of the Hebrew press that reflect true conditions about that country. 
true trends within Israel and facts about what is really happening within the occupied territory in the West Bank and Gaza. Israel Shahak, like myself, speaks with, mainly without gestures, but his words come like thunder, and his words help to answer the question of this symposium. That very fundamental and searching question, is Israel set up for destruction? Or more precisely, perhaps, is Israel setting itself up for destruction? Listen to the words, the evidence, from this Israeli citizen, Israel Shahat. Not evidence from myself, who some say has a certain bias, but from this illustrious citizen of Israel who has no anti-Israeli bias, whatever. Listening to Israel Shahak speak and reading his commentaries, one cannot miss towering evidence of self-destruction. Working within Israel, within Israel's Jewish citizens are forces that are literally shaking society to its very roots. If Israel is set up for destruction, the forces of greatest menace to its survival come from within and are largely Israel's own making. Israel Shahak draws somber and sobering parallels between events in Nazi Germany in the 1930s and what is happening within Israel today. In Nazi Germany, Jews were treated as subhumans, as things, as things to be manipulated, to be abused, to be humiliated, to be destroyed. And Hitler's first goal was to make life so miserable that Jews would leave Germany. He wanted the Jews simply to pack out and leave Europe. There was no thought in those early years of destroying the Jews in the death camps. The final solution did not come until years later. And today, in many ugly, terrible ways, the leaders of Israel are saying of the Palestinians, they must go, they must get out, just like the Nazi message to the Jews in Europe, you must go, you must get out. Indeed, They Must Go is the title of a book, a very candid book written by Israel's candid but popular rabbi politician Meyer Kahani. And Kahani is not the only one who harbors these terrible thoughts that the Palestinians must pack up and go. They must go is the unspoken solution of the Israelis to the Palestinian problem. And it's a solution that is accepted and supported by many Israelis and many Israeli politicians, not just Rabbi Meir Kahani. Israel's goal is clearly to make life so miserable that Palestinians will leave the occupied territory. To their Israeli masters, Palestinians are not people. They are subjects. They are not human beings. They are not children of God. They are things. Israel is engaged in a giant, awful squeeze play on the Palestinians a pincer movement against them. The Palestinians are relentlessly being forced into ever smaller areas of land with ever reduced amounts of water on which to survive. Opportunities for education, for health care, for telephone service are often interrupted and on an unpredictable schedule. Take water. Israel speaks of the theft of water. Cruel, ugly, frightening. Let me explain. The Palestinians in the West Bank of, of the occupied territory get only a meager amount of water per person. 17% of the available water is allocated to the Palestinians in the West Bank. 
The rest is div diverted to the Jewish settlers who occupy ever-growing portions of the West Bank. A Jewish settler in the West Bank gets 12 times as much water as a Palestinian in that same area. And enormous Palestinian-held areas could be irrigated, but the areas lie barren because Israel refuses to permit irrigation. Only when land is taken for Jewish settlements is irrigation permitted. In Gaza, the situation is much worse. Palestinian food production is systematically dried up and destroyed, while that of the Jewish settlers in the Gaza is flourishing. Listen to this terrible fact. 40% of Gaza is reserved for a mere 2,500 Jewish settlers, while another 40% must be divided among 700,000 people. That means that the Jewish settlers in Gaza have 280 times as much land on which to survive as do the Palestinians. Israel Shahak explains in one of his translations from the Hebrew press just how this is done. And I quote from Israel Shahak. By their efficient deep drilling, the Israeli settlements cause the seawater, the salt seawater, to enter the un underground reservoirs tapped by the Palestinians, while their own deeper wells are not affected. How would you like that? In other words, the Israelis cleverly pollute Palestinians' scarce supply of water without hurting their own. Listen again to Israel Shahak, and I quote again, since Palestinians are strictly prohibited from deep drilling or indeed from digging new wells on their land. The result is that the seawater seeps into their existing wells, nor can Palestinians improve the pumping of the water that they need. Even sales of spare parts for pumps, for old pumps, are rigorously controlled. As an American, I hang my head in shame to recount this fact because I know that America is the pipeline without which Israel could not survive and could not inflict this punishment upon those poor people in Gaza and the West Bank. Israel Shahak says torture of Palestinians comes in many forms. Listen again to the words of Israel Shahak. Torture by humiliation. Palestinians, including the elderly, he writes, are frequently ordered to attend the office of the military governor for hours and even days. They are required to stand all that time, patiently and quietly. Even the elderly must politely ask permission of a young Israeli official in order to have the right to go to the toilet. The aim is to reduce all Palestinians without distinction. Here I'm reading again from Israel Shahak. These are not my words. The aim is to reduce all Palestinians without distinction to the level of small children, completely dependent upon higher authority, and to put every Israeli on the higher level. It is also legal, he continues to write, to close all clinics, all medical services in a town, to cut off electricity for hours and days, to cut off telephone service for hours and days. As an American, I hang my sh head in shame to have to recount these facts to you because I know that the U.S. government is the lifeline to Israel without which Israel could not inflict these dreadful policies upon these people. 
and in today's Israel is another echo of the dreadful Nazi past. Book burning, yes, book burning. Can you imagine that in this day and age, book burning? Listen again to Israel Shahak, and these are his words. Israeli soldiers are burning books. Yes, book burning is now in vogue. Soldiers enter a Palestinian library, whether it be in a home or in a public place. They gather up all the books. They put them in a pile outside and set them on fire. They must, they say, destroy books that incite uprising. Well, because they cannot read Arabic, they say, they must burn all books just to make sure that the evil ones are destroyed. And as you know so well, schools and universities are being closed on a haphazard, often permanent basis in the West Bank and Gaza, another powerful instrument to make life unbearable for Palestinians. Torture goes far beyond simply everyday humiliation, though. Even beyond the cutting off of water, the polluting of scarce water supplies, the cutting of telephones, the cutting of medical services, the burning of books. Israel Shahak cites widespread arbitrary arrest and imprisonment without due process, humiliation of young and old, women and children, and the ugly consequences of the government sanctioning of beatings of beatings of innocent people, people on the street as well as those incarcerated in prison. Listen as I quote again Israel Shahak. Israel once showed respect for Palestinian women. They were sacred, but no longer. Now these are Israel Shahak's words, not mine. Now as a matter of routine, a Palestinian woman may expect to be taken into custody without warning and forced to strip to her under, underpants. Then each woman, stripped nearly naked, is taken by a group of Israeli soldiers into a room, the door is locked, and the woman is held there for an hour or so. And Shahak adds somberly, you can use your own imagination about what happens after the door is locked. And as an American, I hang my head in shame to have to recount those dreadful facts to you. Brutality touches men and women, young and old. Listen again to Israel Shahak. In the Israeli army, sadistic impulses of both young and older men are given totally free reign. They may be pursued with almost total impunity, sadistic measures. He, he gives as an example that four soldiers had beaten an Arab to death. They were subsequently exonerated and sent back to their unit. But now I must tell you of a dreadful example of brutality that appeared in the translation of the Hebrew press by Israel Shahak in the most recent issue, that of June of 1989. The account appeared in the widely respected Hebrew newspaper Haaretz as of May the 4th, 1989. I will for the sake of time, summarize what happened. Acting on higher authority, a group of about 30 Israeli soldiers went into a village, rounded up 12 men. There was no accusation of any wrongdoing. They simply rounded them up. The men came peaceably and sat quietly until all 12 were found. Then the 12 Palestinians were taken to a nearby orchard. In groups of three, they separated. By then, they had had their arms shackled behind them. 
There was no way that any of them could use their arms. Three Palestinians were taken to one part of the orchard with a group of Israeli soldiers and three other groups of Palestinians to other points. When they reached their destinations within the orchard, they forced them to lie on the ground. They put shackles now on their legs. Then they took clubs. This was on higher authority. They didn't think this scheme up. It was in the chain of military command. They took clubs and beat on these poor 12 Palestinians until both arms were broken and both legs were broken, with one exception. In each group of three Palestinians, the order was given to break just the arms of one person. So in time, when he could recover his senses from the terrible pain that had been inflicted, he would be able to get himself up on his feet and go to the village and summon help. This dreadful assignment was so terrible, according to the article, that a number of the Israeli soldiers refused to take part. So they stayed in the bus that had brought the group to the orchard. The man operating the buff bus revved up the engines to make them noisy. Flannel was stuffed in the mouths of each of the 12 Palestinians before the beating began. And the news story in this Hebrew language respected daily in Jerusalem stated that most of the, most of the clubs were broken in the process of inflicting this dreadful injury to these innocent people. And don't think this was just an isolated incident, says the story, because just two days earlier, the same unit on the same orders inflicted the same sort of damage in a neighboring village. Let me read from Haaretz's article. Haaretz's article says, this story is a grim one, in the new Israel, any atrocity is possible. Those are not my words. Those are the words of the reporter that dug up the story. And then the article said, it should be noted that since the incident, some of the officers involved have been promoted in rank. No one has been brought to trial. As an American, I hang my head in shame that this happened with U.S. aid, with U.S. complicity, because these dreadful policies could never have been carried out without the acquiescence of the U.S. government. But let me ask larger questions. What happens to a government in which such atrocities have become commonplace. Israel will never be the same. The Israel of Ben-Gurion, the Israel of Nahum Goldman, the Israel of those people who dreamed of a Jewish homeland of consideration for all humanity, that Israel is already destroyed. Destroyed is this vision of a Jewish state devoted to respect for all human beings. What happens to the soldiers who sat on the bus while this dreadful punishment was being carried out? What happens to the minds and the attitude and the character of the soldiers that actually went into the orchard to carry out the beatings? What happens to the officers on high who designed this form of torture intended to keep the Palestinian people in line in their place? And what happens to the Palestinians? Those who were tortured will never forget that experience, nor will their relatives, nor will their neighbors. As long as they live, this dreadful experience will burn in their existence. 
But beyond the torture is another ominous face to the new Israel. Israel Shahak spoke of it with great eloquence and feeling during that luncheon meeting to which I referred. Israel Shahak's clarion call today and his warning is against something that is entirely new, something that Adolf Hitler had no way to inflict upon the Jews in Europe. It's slavery with a high-tech twist. Palestinians are now computerized. Each has an ID card that in the hands of Israeli authorities will call up all vital information about him, any charges that might have been made, whether founded or otherwise. The big brother of George Orwell's 1984 has found ultimate expression in Israel 1989. In Israel Shahak's words, Israeli authorities cannot call up total information about each Palestinian, no matter where they are. And only Jews, of course, can operate the computers. Israel Shahak calls it computer, computerized slavery, the wonders of 20th century. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> The wonders of 20th century civilization, computerized slavery. Isn't it marvelous? To Israel Shahak, <clears throat> computerized slavery is a dreadful evil, an evil so dreadful that, listen to my words, an evil so dreadful that it justifies civil war. Yes, civil war. Am I expressing inflammatory language here tonight in Cape Town, South Africa? These are not my words. These are the words of Israel Shahak, an Israeli Jew, a survivor of the Holocaust, who describes himself as a law-abiding Israeli citizen. He says Israel's, sla Israel's computerized slavery warrants civil war. And he warns also that the next victims of computerized slavery may be the Jews themselves. Evil begets evil. Slavery begets slavery. And he adds this stunning, this shocking note. He reports that a majority of Israeli citizens, 58% of them to be exact, according to a recent public opinion poll, believe that internal disruptive forces within Israel are now so powerful that civil war in Israel is inevitable. 58% of Israeli citizens believe that to be true. And how does Israeli Shahak, that great law-abiding Israeli citizen who grieves for his country, how does he feel about civil war? Here are his words given that day at the luncheon event. I prefer civil war to computerized slavery. What has led Israel Shahak and his countrymen to this forecast of civil war? For part of the answer, let me turn to another scene and another person. At breakfast one January morning, this past January in Cairo, I met by chance a Palestinian Quaker who helps young Palestinians in Gaza who are afflicted with an all too common problem, stress. Get a picture of her. She's short, she's dark skinned with curly hair. She's given to punctuating her words with gestures and emotional fervor. And she describes the horrors as well as the triumph of life under Israeli occupation. Her first, her first name is Mary, and I'm going to leave her name at that. I don't want to give her last name. Let's just call her Mary of Gaza. She read, recited to me two episodes from her own experience. And I want to repeat both of them 
of them to you. Am I still within my time limit, <laughs> Dr. Didat? Okay. At a conference in Holland, she was midway in a detailed description of the brutality of Israeli soldiers as they inflicted injury and often death to Palestinians in the occupied territory. After she finished her lecture, a Jewish woman in the audience stood up and spoke with great, great emotion in her voice as she said, you can't blame the young soldiers. They don't like what they're doing. Don't blame them. They are simply obeying orders. They are ordered to do these things. In other words, they're carrying out orders. That was this Jewish woman's defense of the brutality inflicted by Israeli soldiers on the Palestinians. When she sat down, Mary of Gaza exploded. Mary of Gaza exploded and she said, you are like a Nazi in speaking as you do. What you have said is exactly what was said in defense of German soldiers at the Jewish death camps during World War II, that the German soldiers should not be blamed. They did not like what they were doing, but they were under orders. But that's not the end of the story. Mary of Gaza told me that after the lecture was over and the crowd left the lecture hall, she found this same Jewish lady sobbing in tears outside. The Jewish lady grabbed Mary of Gaza's hand and begged her forgiveness. She told Mary of Gaza these words. She said, what you have said is right. I was just like a Nazi in what I said. Being under orders was no excuse for what the German soldiers did to the Jews during World War II. And being under orders is no excuse for what the Israeli soldiers are doing as well. That's the end of the quote. And to their everlasting credit, many young Israelis are refusing to obey orders these days. Outraged at what the Israeli army is doing to the Palestinians, hundreds and possibly thousands of them simply refuse to serve in the occupied territory. Israel Shahak estimates that the number of those refusing to serve may rise as high as 7,000. He really doesn't know, and I don't suppose anybody else does either. And what is done by the Israeli government to punish those Israeli soldiers who refuse to serve? Nothing, little or nothing, because among those who refuse to serve are some of the great heroes of Israeli military operations. One was the deputy commander of the rescue operation at Entebbe. But other Israelis and other American officials pretend not to see they pretend not to hear. They pretend not to know what's really going on inside Israel. Like Germans during the Holocaust, they cover their ears, they close their eyes, or they simply look the other way. They pretend not to know. And as an American, I hang my head in shame to recount these facts to you. Is Israel headed for destruction? Be reminded, O Israel, of what the Lord said is recorded in the Christian Bible in Amos, second chapter of Amos, verse three. And I quote from the Christian Bible, of all the peoples of the earth, I have chosen you, Israel, alone. That is why I must punish you the more for all your sins. For how can we walk together with your sins between us? Would I be roaring as a lion unless I had reason? The fact is, here again I'm still quoting from the Holy Bible, the fact is I am getting ready to destroy you. Is Israel set up for self-destruction? Be warned, O Israel, 
by the prophetic words of Abraham Lincoln of my home state of Illinois, who said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. This government cannot endure half slave and half free. It will become all one thing or all the other. End of the quote from Mr. Lincoln. Be warned that Israel too will become all one thing or all the other. It cannot survive half slave and half free. Israel is a house divided, half slave, half free. Is Israel set up for self-destruction? Is it too late? It is never too late for goodness and righteousness to prevail over evil. O oh, Israel, be reassured. Israel, be inspired by other words of Abraham Lincoln. Here again I quote, in giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free, generous alike in what we extend and what we preserve. O oh Israel, let your house, even at this late hour, become all free. Israelis, assure your own freedom by extending freedom to your Palestinian slaves. We say thank you to you for a very informative talk. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now call upon Brother Ahmad Didat to do his share. And when he has completed his talk, we will put the meeting open to orderly questions. All people who have questions must kindly make their way to this rocket-looking microphone in front of the stage. And when you put your question, please put it and indicate who should answer you, either Paul Finley or Ahmad Dirat. I will go over the procedure of questioning after Brother Ahmad Dirat's talk. Without further ado, I would like first of all to call those people at the back there to come into the arena. I am sure there are far more seats inside available for you. Quietly make your way to those seats. And now, brothers, ladies and gentlemen, Ahmad Dirat. Alhamdulillah <laughs> wahda. والصلاه والسلام على من لا نبي بعده اللهم يا مفتح الابواب ويا مسبب الاسباب ويا دليل الحائرين توكلت عليك يا رب العالمين ووفد امري الى الله ان الله بصير بالعباد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا ان جاءكم فاسق بنبا فتبين أن تصيبوا قوما بجهالة فتصبحوا على ما فعلتم نادمين صدق الله صدق الله المران الزيم Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters this verse which I have just read to you is not really a part of the symposium this has been forced upon me by our cousins the Jews they forced me to read this because of what Brother Paul Finley had spoken, what he read in the Weekend Star, what he read in this morning's Cape Times, what my, our Jewish cousins, you know, they had said, things about me and about him. And if I allow it to go unanswered, it will be for them to say that, look, this man, he admits his guilt. For that now, I read this ayah from the Holy Quran, 
in which advice is given to us all, more especially the believer. It says, Ya Yuhallazin Amanu, O you who believe, O people of faith, men and women, in Jaakum Fasikun binabain, if an evil monger, a perverted transgressor, comes to you with any news, Fatabayanu, verify it. Ascertain, ascertain whether what he says is true or not before you start spreading it in turn and creating greater mischief and in the end when you discover the truth you regret what you have done this is ayah from surah hujarat hujarat from the holy quran and i would like you my brothers and sisters to go home and check this ayah up not that you doubt me or at any time any learned man gives you references from the Holy Quran, make it a habit of checking up those references. Not that you doubt the speakers. But by checking up, seeing the words, uttering them, reading the meaning and the commentary, then that part of the sharing that the learned man has done will become a part of your own property that you in turn will be able to share with others. Where do you find this? I said Surah Hujarat. How do you find Surah Hujarat in an encyclopedia of this size? Very difficult. There are 114 surahs and Hujarat is only one of them. Are you start going to page through? And this is an encyclopedia of almost 2,000 pages. To be exact, 1,920. Where will you find this Hujarat? In this particular one which has been offered to you when you entered and when you go out, at the back is an index, a very comprehensive index. Anything you want to know, you just browse through the index. You want to know Hujarat and the H, just like in a dictionary, look for Hujarat. Once you have found it, it will tell you chapter 49. 49 is easy to find because every page is numbered. Then I tell you it's ayah number, verse number 6. Very easy. Check it up. And anything, everything, whatever you want to know, you want to know about heaven under H. If you want to know about hell under H, you want to know about the Jews under J. You want to know about Moses under M. You want to know about Jesus under J. What do you want to know? You want to know about marriage, about divorce, about heaven, about whatever you want to know. Go to the index, and this encyclopedia is being offered to you for five rands. A book of 2,000 pages for five rands. There is not another book on earth which you can buy 2,000 pages today with a hardcover for five rands. This is all yours. You owe it to yourself. To buy one, if you haven't got one, take it. And more than one, give to your non-Muslim friends, your employers, your employees, whether they are Jewish or they are Christians. Give it to them. Now this Jewish title tattle. On the Sunday, August, we had this advert on page two. But our Jewish cousins, they were on the alert. On page 19, on page 19, they had the red word advertising us. Advertising Ahmad Didat and Paul Finley. Trying to see how they can character assassinate the people. The purpose of this is to character assassinate. And I'm sure a lot of you have come because on seeing on page 19 what the Jews have to say about Ahmad Didat and Paul Finley. So we are grateful to our Jewish cousins for this extra advertisement. We didn't have to pay for it. <laughs> now, the thing that we can deal with, the most recent event, there were more than 1,000 people in the Athlone Civic Center on Wednesday, last Wednesday. So you will remember more easily how easily people can mislead people who are not there. There were more than a thousand people according to the Cape Times. The reporter was there. On Thursday morning, they produced a picture of the audience and Ahmad Didat speaking. And this reporter, we don't know whether it was Hindu, Muslim, Christian or Jew, because the name is not mentioned, we don't know. 
But reporters have a tendency to sensationalize news. It sells the paper easier, better. Sensationalize things. So this reporter, as a Hindu, Muslim, Christian, or Jew, we don't know who he was. He says, and as he was quoting, he said, "Did that said, Christians who criticize calls for Rushdie's death were hypocrites with a faith that was garbage. There are two different events. The man picks up one event from one place and picks up something else from another place and he joins them together as if this was one sentence uttered by Didat. That the religion of these people, the Christians, is garbage. Now, putting us on a war path with the Christians is a beautiful strategy. We were going to talk about is Israel set up for destruction and now they want to start discussing and fighting with the Christians. Did Didat say this or didn't he? You see, he's a brawler. He's looking for trouble. So those of you who were there, more than a thousand people were there, they will remember that when we were discussing this subject, should Rushdie die? Should he die? And what was the Judeo-Christian verdict? I gave a verdict. What is the verdict? There's not one word about that. What I said in brief was that the Judeo-Christian, meaning the Jewish religion and the Christian religion and the Islamic faith, on this point of blasphemy, they are one. There's nothing mentioned about that. This was the verdict. I said the verdict is one. People get into the news, writing letters under, the, under pen names, nom de plumes, saying, you see, the Judeo-Christian, our standard is far better than those of the Muslims. The Muslims are a barbaric people. So I was suggesting, I said, look at your own book. What does your book say? My book confirms what your book is saying. And garbage, what I said was, those of you who were there will remember, I'm repeating it. It will be available on videotape. So you can't say that Didad is playing with words. What I said was that Christianity was based on the alleged murder of Jesus Christ on the cross. That murder. The Jews, rightly or wrongly, according to their understanding, they said this man deserves to die. He has to be crucified because he blasphemed. That was the Jewish charge against Jesus Christ. So I said this crucifixion is the foundation of Christianity. And as such, Paul, the great Saint Paul, in his book of Corinthians, I didn't mention chapter and verse, I tell you now, chapter 15, verse 14. He says, I'm quoting Paul. Paul says, if Christ is not risen from the dead, our preaching is vain, your faith is vain. This is what Paul said. And I went on to explain vain, worthless, useless garbage. I didn't say that Christianity was garbage. This is what Paul says. That if this is not so, if there is no such thing as Christ dying and getting raised from the dead, then the religion is worthless, useless garbage. Now they said, I said that Christianity is garbage. I said, Paul says that. <laughs> now this is how they play tricks. How can you give battle to these sort of things? I am suggesting to my Jewish brethren, look, please, do us a favor. Do ourselves a favor, you and us. Call me to your synagogues. Call me to your halls. Talk to me. Discuss with me. I want to share my thoughts and feelings with you. Come, argue and debate with me. You have giants in your midst. All the QCs in the country, or what you call senior, senior councils, are mostly Jews. You have giants of literature in your midst. Come, talk to me. Now, if I played a similar trick, see if you can catch it. I'm playing a trick now. I'm telling you that in the Jewish Bible, that is the Old Testament, David, the Hebrew king, in his Psalms, chapter 14, the 14th Psalm, verse 1, he says, there is no God. This man of God, he says, there is no God. Look, I quoted you, chapter 14, 
I'm sorry, Psalms 14, verse 1. And I have the Bible with me. And I can show you the words of David saying, There is no God. Now, is there anybody who can, who can tell me whether anything is wrong with that? I'm telling you, I show you here. If I can't show you, I don't know what, I, what you want from me. 5,000, 10,000 rand, what do you want? I give it to you. David, a man of God, saying, There is no God. Correct. You see, my brother knows that I'm reading it out of context. That's correct. The words are there. The full verse is, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. The words are there, there is no God. But the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Can you see now, deceive people like that. You take things out of context, you have no right to do. If you did it in error, people rectify you. You have a right to apologize. You should apologize. And if you have done it deliberately, it's devilish, is it unforgivable? I don't know the reporter, the journalist who put down that I said Christianity is garbage. If he did it deliberately, it's something unforgivable. Now, advertisement you saw, we had distributed a hundred thousand of these in Cape Town. You remember receiving this? The face of fear. We gave out a hundred thousand. If you haven't received one yet, in case, no, the booklet that's given to you. It was supposed to be a passport into the hall, the booklet. Arabs and Israel, conflict or conciliation. I'm sure you have it. Now, if you open there, page 25, open it, 25, you'll see that picture close at hand. Because from that far distance, you can't see this. Page 25 of that booklet. That's why this was supposed to be a ticket into the hall. If you didn't have it, you shouldn't have been in. You should not have been allowed. Got it? This child, he is looking straight into your eyes. He's looking straight into your eyes because he was looking into the eye of the camera. Can you see that? If, because he was looking into the eye of the camera, it appears he's looking at you. What is he doing? He is crying for help. He is crying for sympathy. He is asking, have you any to give? Have you any sympathy to give this child? Now, I am saying here on that page that this is a set up. The Jewish soldiers were set up for this picture. This boy, the woman, the gaping girls with open mouths, they are all set up because the cameraman, he had to be at the right place to catch this picture. If he was a little left, he couldn't have caught it. If he was a little right, if he was behind in front there, we would never have seen this picture. That means as if he had programmed the people. So you soldiers, you do like this. And you child, you look at the camera. There, straight into the eye. Okay. And you mom, you know, you hold your child and try and save it from the Jews. And you girls, open your mouth as if you are terrified. Can you look at the picture? As if this was a setup. How can you get a picture like this? And this terrified my Jewish cousins, this picture. I advertised this in the local newspapers, and they activated, they activated the major newspapers, the Sunday Times not to print it, the Sunday Tribune not to print it, the Natal Mercury not to print it, the Natal Daily News not to print it, the Transvala, the Ilang Alasi Natal, even the Zulus, the gagged even the Zulus, they did it in protest. They didn't want us, the world, to know what is going on in Palestine. Now, I said, this picture was a set up, and this idea of set up comes again and again in our human experience. Bishop, this is from the Express and the Star in the UK. Bishop ready for a serious debate. There is here a bishop of Birmingham, the Right Reverend Mark Santa. He says that I had a debate with a Palestinian Christian on the subject, the Quran or the Bible, which is God's word. And my Christian opponent, 
from the Christian's point of view, they were not happy with the performance. So the news goes to the bishop, and the bishop says in this report, he says, he claimed that the two mass meetings organized by the group at Birmingham NEC National Exhibition Center, which debated the merits of the Bible and the Quran, had been, in inverted commas, a set up. What was he trying to say? That that meeting was a setup. In other words, we must have bribed this guy, Shurosh, this Palestinian Christian, say, so here's $10,000 for you. Come over from America. We're going to have a boxing match. And in the second round, third round, you know, when I just touch you, you just fall down. And then, you know, that I can be declared a winner. A setup. That's a setup. You make prior arrangement as to what is going to happen, how you do things. Setup. Setup. Then, Jimmy Swaggart wanted to get to Makkah and Medina, and I made an arrangement that he can appear on TV throughout the Middle East among all the Muslims. And I sent that offer in writing. I said, look, the things are arranged, come. So he didn't reply to my letter. I sent another letter, no reply. I sent him a telegram, no reply. I got his telex number, I telexed him, no reply. Nine months later, full period of gestation, nine months, he replies, he says, he was set up. He wanted to have nothing to do with Didat because he was set up. Amazing. Everybody, when he gets cornered, he says he's set up. And I do believe, I do believe in people getting set up. Involuntary. This general setting up. When I analyzed the problem, I saw that there was some setting up done. Who did the setting up? Not Ahmad Didat. The students who organized the debate, they didn't do it. But there was some power beyond Didat and Swagat and our children who organized the debate. It setting up had taken place. And that setting up was done by the Almighty, God Almighty. He sets up things. He sets up people. And to give you an example from the Holy Quran and the Holy Bible, we read the story about the Palestinians and the Jews. This is not a new story. It is more than 3,000 years old. The Bible speaks about the confrontation between the Palestinians and the Jews for 3,000 years. You read there from the very beginning, from the book of Deuteronomy, it carries on. That again and again, the Jews, they destroyed the Palestinians utterly. Men, women, children, and even donkeys were not spared. Again, destroyed them utterly. And they come back from where? Nobody knows. And they destroyed them again, utterly. And again they come back, no one knows where. This battle between the Palestinians and the Jews have been going on for 3,000 years. This is nothing new. At one stage, in the confrontation between the Jews and the Palestinians, the Palestinians, they have Goliath in their midst, a giant, an eight-foot giant. Naturally, puny people, when they have a big man in their midst, they now feel that they can now confront the Jews because they have a giant in their midst. So the Palestinians on one hilltop, with Goliath in their midst, he's shouting to the Jews on the opposite hill, say, oh Jews, oh Jews, come, come. Come, is there anybody there who's prepared to take me on? I'll chew you alive. And from the man's size, it appeared that no Jew could have come anywhere near, near Goliath. And if he did, and if Goliath got hold of the fellow, the Jew would be squeezed to death. The Jews were shivering in their pants. I don't know whether they used to wear pants those days, but metaphorically, they were shivering in their pants. So little David, he comes up to Saul, the commander, and he says, look, I will take that fellow on. So what? You go and look after your father's sheep. Because he was a shepherd boy. He was no prophet, he was no man, he was a boy, a shepherd boy. So you, you want to fight the giant when we veterans of so many wars, none of us dare to confront the man, the giant? David says, look, look. He's so enthusiastic. Man, what an opportunity I have. I know I can do the job. 
Saul says, go and look after your father's sheep. He said, no, 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 you don't know, man. I can slay the giant. I can do it. So Saul offers David his sword and his shield. Young David says, look, I have never used it in my life before. And perhaps the sword is too heavy for him to carry. Now, David had to be there. What was he doing there? You see, if the battle was taking place here, here where the Good Hope Center is, and our little David was five kilometers away, we would have never heard of David. David had to be there on the scene. He had to be there. So when he refuses the sword and the shield, David says, look, I'm going to use my sling. So what? A toy? You want to fight a giant with a toy? But he has seen the opportunity. This huge giant, slow, cumbersome. You know, a man who's a giant, he's abnormal. He is not even steady on his feet. And David saw the opportunity. So eventually, eventually, Saul gives him permission. So go, if you want to commit suicide, go. So David walks down the hill. At the stream, he picks up a few pebbles, small stones, and he puts one in his pouch, and he swings and he swings to gain momentum, the old-fashioned sling, because they didn't discover rubber those days. There was no rubber then. It was a pouch with two strings attached to it. He swung and he swung, and he, at the right moment, he let the one side go. And the missile, the, pell the stone, flew and hit Goliath on the forehead. Cracked his skull. Goliath fell. Little David rushes up, takes his own sword, and chops off his head. And there was consternation in the Palestinian camp. The giant is gone. The hope of his side lost first blow. So the Quran reminds us, it says, وَقَتَلَ دَاوُدُ جَالُوتَ And David killed Goliath. وَأَتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكَ And God gave him dominion. وَالْحِكْمَةَ And wisdom. وَعَلَّمُهُ مِمَّا يَشَاء And whatever else he will. So the Jew says, David killed Goliath. The Christian says, David killed Goliath. The Muslim says, David killed Goliath. I'm saying that poor Goliath was set up. <laughs> Think of it. You see, the Goliath had to be there. David had to be there for this opportunity. If he was five kilometers away, history would never have known who David was. That man was set up. Who did the setting up? David? No. Saul? No. The Palestinians? No. Somebody, they're setting up. Who? There is one above. He sets up. And from that angle, we say people are set up continually. Here is a picture. If you haven't received it yet, take one when you go, as you go out. His Holiness the Pope. His Holiness the Pope. Without any disrespect, look at the picture. He is playing hide and seek. Look, this picture, you must get it. You must keep it. He's playing hide and seek. I don't want to do what he's doing because you are all catching with the camera and, and the photos, and then you're going to show that Didat is also playing hide and seek. <laughs> but you get this picture. I showed this to a Christian missionary soon after its publication. A missionary was always at my meetings, the first man to come and ask me questions. I went to him and I showed him this. I showed him this picture. And the caption, he said, where did you get the picture? Where did you get the picture? I said, look, this picture was done for me. He says, no. I said, this picture was specially taken for me. He says, no. So I'm asking him, you want a picture like this? He says, no. I said, look, I wanted it. I need this picture for my title of my pamphlet, His Holiness Playing Hide and Seek with the Muslims. Now, what better picture can anybody take? Is there anything human? Look, if you paid the, His Holiness, the Pope, $100,000 to behave like this, would he have done it? No. I needed it, and I get it in the post. I get it in the post. His Holiness playing hide and seek with Muslims. You can have this, my son. You can keep it. You see, I said His Holiness was set up. Everybody gets set up. And I was set up in 1967 by Jewish students of the University of Cape Town.
I was here in your fair city on a lecture tour. And my meetings were being advertised in the newspapers. What the Bible says about Muhammad, Christ in Islam, was Christ crucified, Muhammad the natural successor to Christ, and so on. The Jewish students, they're seeing those adverts, they phoned the organizers and said, look, what about Mr. D. Dad coming and speaking to us? So they asked me, I said, it's a privilege by God to go and speak to my nephews, my children. Mm. And the meeting was arranged in the Rondi Bosch, in Rondi Bosch, the Jewish students had purchased a hall, you know, from the Christians, it was some church hall, they purchased it and they had the club running there. So I went down to talk to them. And in that talk, I was speaking about the Quran and the Jew. And I was reasoning with them that the problem between the Muslim and the Jew can be solved very, very easily. I said, we have such a common denominator. In our concept of God, no difference. In our dietary laws, you say no eating of the flesh of swine, we say we won't eat it. You say you, don't need, you mustn't eat blood, we say we won't touch it. You say circumcision, we say we are all circumcised. What more do you want? We would say that Islam is Judaism made universal. The only real difference between us is a label. You have got a different label from me. The question is simply change the label. You want to solve the problem? Change the label. You see, I said, our own Chris Barnard here in Cape Town, he did this heart ops. What is the biggest problem in a heart op? Rejection. Why the rejection? The body needs a new heart. And they put a new heart into the body. And when that is done, the body starts fighting it. You know that? The body starts fighting the heart because it's a foreign element. The cellular construction of the heart is different from that of the body. So the body starts fighting and in trying to kill the heart, it kills itself. So they have to suppress that battle, that battle between the body and the heart. So they start drugging, drugging, drugging the patient until the body is so senseless it doesn't know who is a friend and who is a foe. <laughs> Getting it used to that heart. This is the battle in blood, this heart transplant. Same thing now with you and us, the Muslim and the Jew, you are a new heart and the body can't recognize that heart. Because your cellular construction of this heart is Jew, 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 and that of the body is Muslim, 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 Muslim. So what you should do is change the label. So at question time, one young man, our, my nephew, young Jew, he said, why don't you change your label? I said, look, I don't mind changing my label. If I want to change my label, I said, the Jews, they put hurdles in my way. You know, and if I overcome all those hurdles, eventually if you convert me as a Jew, I'm still a third grade Jew. But I said, what have you achieved? Suppose I change my label. Me, in other words, I become a Jew, get converted to Judaism. What have you achieved? I said, how many are you in the world today? So somebody said, we are 12 million. Today, there are about 15, 15 million. He said, 12 million. I said, now we become 12 million and one. With me become a Jew, we become, you become 12 million and one. But I said, you know, if you change your label, we are at that moment, we said we are 700 million. We become 700 million and one. Don't you see what a difference it makes? And I said, you are a business people. You Jews are a business people. You got the business mentality. No man, if you are a professional, your mentality is that of a businessman. I said, you have a product for which you have a market of 12 million. Simply by changing the label, you get 700 million people to buy. I said, you are a fool if you didn't pay. <laughs> Let us become Muslims. What is the difference? By God, what is the difference? What is the real difference? There is really no difference, except we say, you are a Jew, and I say, I'm a Muslim, and we are at war. So at question time, one young Jew, he says, now who's going to do the job? Who will do the job? I say, you. You will have to do the job. You're sitting on our chest. You Jews are sitting on our chest, meaning in the 67 war, they flattened the Arab world. 
in six days. So you're sitting on our chest. I said, get off, get off our chest and say, brother, look, we have done you wrong. Please forgive us. Where can we go? And by God, I says, these Arabs will say, cousin, live with us. We have been living for a thousand years without strife. We can still continue to live. But I says, give him your hand of friendship, your compassion, and see what happens. The young Jew, he said, you know, I have just returned from the six-day war. I'm going to complete my medical studies. And as soon as I return home, meaning to Israel, I will take your message home to Israel. And I see evidence of that happening. I see evidence of that happening. I will come to that. You see, there was a role. God Almighty, we believe, the Quran testifies that God had chosen the Jews, the Bani Israel. The Quran says, Ya Bani Israel, askuru ni'mati allati anamtu alaykum. Say, O children of Israel, remember the special favors which I did unto you. Wa anni faddaltukum al alameen. That I preferred you above all the peoples of the earth for my special favors. He chose you. You say you are a chosen people. I say, yes, you are a chosen people. You say it's in the Bible, I say it's also in the Quran. You are a chosen people. Chosen for what? Because of your race? Because of your language? Because of your riches? No. You were chosen for a purpose. And that purpose is spelled out for you in, in, in your Torah, in the Bible, in the second book of the Bible called Exodus. Moses is made to say, Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. He says, Moses, now therefore, if ye will obey my voice, God is speaking through Moses, if you Jews will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me, something special. If you listen to God's voice, listen to his commandments, become right with him, he says, you will be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. Quran says, Wa anni alameen, That I preferred you above all the peoples of the earth for my special favors. For all the earth is mine, says the Lord. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's your job. You are supposed to be a kingdom of priests. Guide mankind to the knowledge of God. That, that was the role that, why God chose you. Now you have done away with that role. You have made your religion a racial religion. All the strife in the world, whatever happened in Germany, whatever happened for the past 2,000 years, is on account of that you have lost that role. You have done away with that role. And if you do not carry out the duties and responsibilities which God had imposed upon you for making you the chosen people, he says, the same God, he says, in your book, in your Torah, in the book of Leviticus, the fourth book of Moses, Chapter 26, verse 18. And after all this, if you do not obey me, God is talking. You Jews, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Seven times more. Anybody else, you commit one crime, one punishment. You Jews, you get seven times more punishment. This is your book, your book of authority, your book of God. Your Torah, verse 21. Then if you walk contrary to me and are not willing to obey me, I will bring on you seven times more plagues. Seven times more plagues upon you, the Jews, according to your sins. Verse 28. Then I also will walk contrary to you. You walk contrary to me, I will also walk contrary to you in fury. And, e and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. I don't know, when Hitler incinerated six million Jews, whether it was six times or seven times, I don't know. But shh, I said, look, this is according to the promise made by God to your nation. You go contrary to my will, this is the punishment in store for you. And he warns you. He warns the Jews in their own holy book, the own holy Bible, the Old Testament, which is the Bible of the Jews. He warns them. In the last and final will of Moses, the last will and testament of Moses, the book of Deuteronomy, fifth book, chapter 28, verse 68. Moses is speaking. 
and the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt. You have already come out. After you have come out, in the Sinai, Moses is speaking to the Jews, and the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again, again, with ships, by the way whereof I spoke unto thee, thou shalt see it no more. Though I told you, look, man, I have freed you from Egypt, but he'll bring you back. Notwithstanding, I, I have freed you now from the Egyptian bondage, but I will bring you back into Egypt. And there you shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen. Slaves, you'll be sold as slaves. Your men and your women will be sold as slaves. I'm reading your book. I don't know whether there are any Jews who are listening or whether they'll carry my words to them. God says, he says, I, you will be sold a second time, a second bondage, only once you have been in bondage so far in Egypt. This is the second bondage God is promising the Jews. You'll be sold as born men and born women, slave men and slave women. And no man shall buy you. You'll be such a rubbish that nobody will have you even. Even as slaves, they won't own you. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 68. Look, I said, you are set up for all this. This is a setup going on. You are not going to listen. It's right. He gives you rope. He gives you rope. He's given you rope. Go on, go on, as he gave Hitler rope. This mighty Hitler. <laughs> I said, great, in, 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 in terror, in cruelty. His army is marching to Russia 2,000 kilometers nonstop. You know, that man, Hitler, because of him, 40 million people died. The Second World War. But there is hope. There is hope. According to Holy Scriptures, there is hope. There is a chance. You see, every time God Almighty gives people power, position, might, is a test. How you use it. It is destiny or destruction. See, the title would have been too long. Is Israel set up for destiny or destruction? We said destruction. But always, always is destruction goes destiny. He's giving you a chance. And he says, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 19, verses 23 to 25, he says, in that day, a day is coming, in that day there shall be a highway out of Egypt a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt. One third means there is a tripartite, tripartite was it? Three in one nation. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people. First time in the Holy Bible is the words expressed for Egypt. Every other time, Egypt, the plagues of Egypt, the filth of Egypt, the whoredoms of Egypt. Everything of the worst things is Egypt for a change. Listen, this God is talking now, the same God, so whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people and Assyria the work of my hands, and Israel my inheritance. All together in one brotherhood, serving together. This is what the Christian translation of the Bible said. Serve together, all the Assyria, what is Assyria? Assyria that Isaiah saw in his vision is Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, all that is Assyria, and Egypt, and Palestine, this is all together three in one this is the holy trinity which is a real trinity not the father son and holy ghost here is the trinity unity in trinity serving together gives the impression that serving in the army one armed force can be but no you take the jewish translation of the hebrew scriptures of the old testament the jewish translation i have it printed in america by the jews in that the word is they shall worship together. Serve means serving God. Worship together. In what? Faith. As a Christians? As Jews? As Jews, if the Jews were going to rule, according to Judaism, they will reject Jesus and they will reject Muhammad. Constant strife. 
If the Christians were, if Christianity was to prevail and worship together as Christians, the, the Christians will accept the prophets of the Old Testament, probably, and they will reject Muhammad, strife. Only the Muslims, as Islam that we worship together, the Muslim says he believes in Moses and David and Solomon and Jesus and Muhammad. Only as Muslims can you worship together, serve together. As I said, that offer that I had made to the students in Rondi Bosch, perhaps one of those students went back to Israel. And I'm reading in the Star, one of our leading newspapers, the Star from Johannesburg. It says, then there is Henry Katzu. Katzu is well known among the Jews. Henry Katzu, K A T Z E W, Katzu, a former South African journalist now living in Israel. Henry Katzu, who reported in the leading daily, The Star, dated the 5th of December 73, under the caption, For Israel, a perpetual specter of war, always the war, the sword of Damocles on their heads. For Israel, a perpetual specter of war. He continues, the 25-year history, in bracket I put my own words, it's in the book, when you go home you can read it, the full quotation, now over 40, now over 40 years, the strife, war going on of the Judeo-Arab conflict since the birth of Israel should bring Israelis to the conclusion that politics will not solve the Jewish problem. This is a Jew talking now. But immediately you say, look, this Jew here, this is what he says, the Jews say he is a self-hating Jew. He hates to be a Jew himself. Must be something terribly wrong with your nation. That every time a man speaks out, he is a self-hating Jew or is an anti-Semite. He says, he continues, they must be prepared, the Jews must be prepared to open themselves to a spiritual alternative. Uh, not my words. Go and check them up in the archives of the newspapers. They must be prepared, the Jews must be prepared to open themselves to a spiritual alternative, to effect a spiritual revolution, which in turn would lead to the vast new developments. I said, this young man must have been listening to me in the Rondi Bosch, that Hall of the Jews, in 1967. And again and again, learned men of the Jews, erudite scholars, Robert J. Donovan, on page 17 of his book, Israel's Fight for Survival, he says, in a report of the Institute for the Middle East, published in 1959, it was noted that there was a time when there was no such thing as an Arab-Jewish problem. No Arab-Jewish problem. When relationship between the two peoples were as normal as those between cousins. And Prof Professor Goitain, the chairman of the School of Oriental Studies in the, at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, on page 21 of his book, Jews and Arabs, he repeats the same words. He says, there is much more to the popular belief that Jews and Arabs are close relatives, cousins. He puts down cousins, close relatives, and he says cousins, because they were descended from the brothers Isaac and Ishmael, the sons of Abraham, coming from the same father, Abraham. They were cousins. And the latest, the latest, on the 1st of January this year, 1989, 1st of January, Danny Bental, a Jew, described as a reservist in the Israeli army during his latest tour of duty in Gaza. This Jew, he is serving in the Israeli army during his latest tour of duty in Gaza, reports in the Star again. This is not a Muslim newspaper. They refuse to put our our advert a second time because of the Jewish protest. We wanted to repeat our advert, they stopped it. They said, no, our Jewish people, customers, they don't want us to have that thing in. That star reports this young Jew talking. He is a journalist. He says, the Palestinian state already exists. This state of Palestine already exists 
Let there be no mistake about that. It exists in Jabalia and Shati, in the mosques and in the mind. In the mind of the people, this Palestinian state is there. It exists. Judging by the proliferation of Palestine liberation organization flags in Shati, we have already begun to lose the battle for this square mile of Eretz Israel. This is the start. That first battle says we have already started to lose this battle for the first square mile of Israel is already gone. He says a sort of status quo has been reached. They have nothing to lose. The Palestinians have got nothing to lose. From this point on, life is cheap. By God, life is cheap when you know what you're fighting for. They are fighting for their independence, their national identity, their pride. He continues, for all the fear we inspire in the local populace, we no longer maintain absolute control over their lives, no longer maintain absolute control over their lives. The symptoms of eventual defeat for the Jews are already obvious. Who is he? A self-hating Jew, an anti-Semite. Say so. I want the guys who can say, look, this guy's an anti-Semite. He is a man serving the Israeli army and reported in one of the most leading newspapers of South Africa, the Star, not in a Muslim newspaper in Saudi Arabia. He says, he continues, we catch a rock-throwing child, child-throwing stone, probably no more than 12 years, no more than 12 years old. In his eyes, I detect a certain pride behind the fear of what is about to happen to him. Soldiers start shouting, hit him, smash his head in, break his arms, so he won't throw stones again. Teach him a lesson. He continues, this, this from soldiers who only days before had been law-abiding and God-fearing citizens. This from people, days before, God-fearing people, law-abiding citizens, and God-fearing citizen of the state that was created in order to shelter Jews from exactly those sentiments. Why was they say according? Why did they create Israel? Because they're being persecuted by the Christians. For a thousand years, six million Hitler destroyed. They wanted a refuge to protect them from all these hit, kill the Jews, Christ killers. They killed our Lord and they burned them. They raped their women, burned their homes. They wanted refuge and they got it. God gave it to them. Now, so these are the very people doing this. He says, he's crying. This Denny bin Tal, this Jew, young Jew is crying. So we, more than any other nation on earth, should understand that. Whenever a youth hurls a rock at me, stone at me, I cannot but feel guilty in the knowledge that where I, in his situation, I would also be throwing rocks. If people were doing that to me, I would do the same thing to him. I'll be throwing rocks. But how can I? A soldier turned to him and say, as a Jew whose people have known so much suffering at the hands of others, I sympathize with you. How can I say that? He is a soldier of Israel. How can he say that? I sympathize with you for what you're doing to me. These children, these children are beautiful. Out of the litter and the stench, they emerge young jewels with clear dust-colored faces and white, bright, innocent-seeming eyes. The three-year-olds wave at us as our petrol passes. The five-year-olds already understand that we are the enemy. Gleefully, they show us the V for victory sign, not really appreciating what it means. Innocent children. We all know. We all know, the Jewish soldier says, we all know what to do, behaving firmly, yet politely, as the situation demands. And the situation sometimes demand us to be sons of bitches. Now go and quote me. He said, Didat says that the Jews are sons of bitches. You know, what sickness is this? I'm telling you, this is Danny Bental, a Jewish reservist. These are his words reported in, in a reputable newspaper called The Star. And he says, and the situation sometimes demand us to be sons of bitches. And what are they going to do tomorrow morning in the newspapers? We say, Didat says the Jews are sons of bitches. They, that's what they're going to say. Dida said that they are sons of bitches. Am I saying that? This is what the Jew is saying, that this is how we behave, like sons of bitches. You know what that means. 21 years. 
21 years have gone by since the territories fell under Israeli control. A whole generation has grown up there, yet they are no closer to accepting us as anything but a foreign occupying power. And the Jewish settlers continue to live the lie, locked in their government subsidized houses out of earshot of the rioting neighbors. They appreciate, they appreciate that the safety depends on the army. Every evening, they travel the strip in minibuses, distributing hot soup and food to the weary patrolling troops, trying to bribe them. They say, look, look after us, look after us. Because they know. Israel knows. You'll see the pictures in, the, in, in, in that little booklet. Look at the children there. Look at the women there in, the, in those pictures. And you'll realize that if the Jews only put down their arms for a week, these little children and the women will chew the Jews alive. They'll tear them to pieces with their bare hands. Why wait for that? Why create that? He says here, every evening, and food to the weary patrolling troops, most soldiers accept gratefully. Soldiers are soldiers. Somebody brings you hot soup, hot cakes, samosas, kusistas, who wouldn't like to have them? Hmm? Accept gratefully. Others kid themselves that by logical argument, they may persuade the settlers that the day of judgment will come and they will return to live in Israel, their bank accounts swelled beyond recognition by government compensation. The few peace-seeking idealists among us, among the soldiers of Israel, refuse that charity. They won't even tolerate, they won't even have that hot soup. They won't have that hot samosas, nothing. They know what it means, that's bribery, you're bribing us to carry on with this work. It says, the few peace-seeking idealists among us, among the soldiers of Israel, refused their charity, not willing to condone the occupation by even the tiniest of symbolic acts. The Quran describes them beautifully. Allah says, Min humul mu'minuna wa humul fasikun. Among them, there are sincere, good-hearted, good people. Among the Jews, God says in the Quran, Min humul mu'minuna wa humul fasikun. But the majority of them are perverted transgressors. And he says about those, yet there are Israeli politicians, those perverted transgressors, who for their own cynical ends perpetuate the myth that the intifada, the uprising, the revolution in the making is trifling. It's nothing. You got the gun, you got the power. So those who claim that the grassroots popular revolution can be quelled deliberately mislead the nation. The fact is that there is no military solution to this political problem. There is no military solution to this political problem. Almost every reservist who has spent time in the territories this year has seen to that, has seen that. There is no political solution. There is no solution with the gun. And you carry on. He says, and if we stay, we are going to be dragged deeper into the quagmire. As world opinion shifts even further against us, eventually a solution of sorts will be forced upon us, upon the Jews. We will retreat with our tail between our legs, like a beaten dog with the tail between your legs. This is what he says. This is how we're going to end off when the whole world opinion. And there is a saying, there is a saying among us Muslims that there is a hadith which says a time will come that even the stones will cry that there is a Jews hiding behind me. You know what that implies? Stones don't talk. This is the language of the Bible also. Jesus Christ telling the Jews, he says, think not that you have Abraham as a father, for God can raise up children unto the stones to Abraham. Stones means this rubbish, heartless people, backward, barbaric people. Out of them he can create people who can represent the message of God. Stones, meaning the most hard-hearted people, most cruel people. Even they will recognize that this Jew is hiding behind a Christian name, a facade, a facade. Get him, get him, get him. I said, why wait for that? Why not come right with God? Come right with the people, do justice to them. They're only asking for justice. Anti-Semites, again and again, anti-Semites. Max I demand. Jews know. An erudite Jewish historian, Max I. Dimon, in his book, Jews, God, and History, on page 205, he says, Today, the Arab world is arising from its slumber. I say thanks to you, Jews. If 
the Arabs can use the Jews to hoist themselves out of the abyss into which history has hurled them, they can be blamed no more than other nations which are playing similar power politics. It is up to Jewish leaders in their own national self-interest to convince the Arab leaders that the Arab world can achieve its legitimate aims with the friendship of the Jews as in days past. Astute statesmanship can relax the present Israeli-Arab tensions because they are not caused by deep-rooted racial and religious antagonisms. But that by temporary political expediencies, history has shown, concludes Max I. Dimont, history has shown that Jew and Arab can live together without strife and with mutual profit. And Rodinson, another leading Jewish writer, I say cry with Rodinson. Rodinson is crying. In his book, Israel and the Arabs, this Jew is crying, Rodinson. But for one thing, they, the Israelis, cannot be said to have a historic right to a piece of territory because some of their ancestors supposedly inhabited it 2,000 years ago. For another, they ought to be to recognize that they have done a considerable wrong to another people in depriving them of rights at least as great as their own. The bitterness felt by the people to whom this wrong was done still persists. And as long as it does, the rights of the Israelis will remain purely hypothetical. They can only hope that the Arabs will one day recognize and accept them. Only then will the rights become real. The Arabs, too, have rights. In many respects, they may justifiably be held to be greater than Israelis. The Arabs of Palestine have the same rights over Palestine territory as the French exercise in France and the English in England. These rights have been violated without any provocation on their part. The wrong done to the Arabs by the Israelis is very real. The Jews say anti-Semites. Moses is an anti-Semite. Believe me, Moses says, you uh, behold a stiff-necked people. Say, so you Jews, you have been rebellious against the Lord since the day I knew you. Read Isaiah, read Amos. Yeah, Jewish prophets, what they have to say about you? Are they all anti-Semites? They hate you, or they hate themselves? What have you done? My dear brothers and sisters, There is a chance. There is a growing number of people among the Jews who realize this. As Brother Paul Finley has pointed out, Israel Saad, people like him. There are others, like Benny, Danny Bintal, like Henry Kazio. There are people among the Jews who are crying for the, about the injustice, that you are worse than the Nazis. You're doing things that the, what the Nazis didn't do to you, you are doing to these poor Palestinians. And this is, as soon as the world opinion, the world is realizing, yeah, they're not, everybody's not asleep. They're knowing what's going on now. Day by day, more and more things are coming in the news. Daily, they're killing little children. Little, little children are being killed daily. This is the fate in the Times Magazine, Times Magazine, the weekly news magazine, International. We read there, the Palestinian question. I end with this. So what manner of man would retaliate against a stone-throwing child by shooting him in the back as he ran away? What kind of people are these who would shoot a stone-throwing child by shooting him in the back as he ran away? What manner of government would retaliate by fining already poverty-stricken parents a thousand dollars, demolishing their home and confiscating their meager possessions? What manner of people are these arrogant settlers who think they have a God-given right to commit such atrocities and still cry for more? What manner of people are we that we permit our government to give away billions of the American taxpayers' dollars to Israel every year, enabling it to continue to subjugate the Palestinian people? What manner of people are we, the Americans? This man is an American, Alice F. Smith from Santa Barbara, California, in the Times Magazine, February 20th, 1989. There are people who are waking up to the situation, and this will create either you change or destined for destruction. Wa dawana alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Brother Ahmadirat, 
We wish to say thank you very much to you indeed for a very well delivered talk. I personally believe that we have done justice under the circumstances and in the time available for treating the topic that was chosen. I also wish to say at this point in time, thank you to Mr. Marie and his helpers for having tried their best to solve the problem. We come now to the close of the gathering where you will be allowed to come to the microphone in front and put a question to either Mr. Paul Findlay or Brother Ahmadirat. But this part of the meeting needs to be controlled. Each person who puts a question should remember that it must be a question, not a debate, and not a lecture. And Mr. Didat or Mr. Finley are compelled to reply. Whilst this is taking place, the questioner must be given every opportunity to state his case, and so must the speaker. We are presently having only this one microphone, so you must please bear with us. If there are people who have questions pertaining to what was discussed tonight, please make your way to the microphones now. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim My name is Ahmed from Egypt. Um, I would like to ask, why doesn't the Jews um, not uh, acknowledge of the state of Palestinian and they know that the Palestinian is Arabia and they know that they take all the land from the Palestinian by the force, the gun and the cannon and everything like that. As I understand the question, it is this. Why does Israel not permit the Palestinians to be represented by the leadership of the Palestine Liberation Organization. Is that your understanding of the question? It's a very searching question, a very important question. I tend to talk too long. I'll try to keep my response brief. There is no question but what the PLO, headed by Yasser Arafat, is the acknowledged leader of the Palestinians wherever they live, whether they be in the occupied territory or in South Africa. No question about it. But Israel is in a very unique political position thanks to the United States. Israel does not have to deal with its neighbors in a normal fashion. The lobby for Israel in the United States has become so effective, so efficient in influencing the behavior of the U.S. government that Israel has been able to count on American support for its policies wherever they turn. That means that Israel, because of the influence of Israel's lobby in the United States, is able to behave in an unprecedented, unprecedented manner in dealing with the Palestinian leadership. In every other political situation of this sort, one party has been able to select its own leadership and the other party has been able to select its own leadership. But thanks to the power of Israel's lobby in the United States and the support that our government gives to the leadership of Israel, Israel is able to take this unprecedented position of demanding the right to select the leadership of the Palestinian movement itself. That's the root of the problem. Now, were it not for the extraordinary power of Israel's lobby in the United States, the government of Israel would be forced to come to terms in a normal fashion 
with its neighbors, including the Palestinians in the occupied territory. But as long as Israel can depend upon the uncritical, undivided, powerful financial, military, economic, and moral support of the United States, it does not have to behave in a normal fashion. That's the, the answer to your question, wherever the questioner is. And I believe there is something that that gentleman can do to make a change. At the risk of being self-serving here tonight, Mr. D. Dot, I would urge that gentleman to get a copy of my book out in the lobby before he leaves. My book is entitled, They Dare to Speak Out. It tells exactly how Israel's lobby has been able to attain this enormous control over the policies of the U.S. government. And if that gentleman would get a copy of that book and read it, and then mail it to someone he knows in the United States, he will help to bring understanding among the people of the United States about how U.S. policy in the Middle East is, is made. Because despite our enormous potential for communication, despite our books, <coughs> despite our magazines, our newspapers, the American people simply are in ignorance about how U.S. policy is made. They really don't know about the power of Israel's lobby and each of you here tonight can help to awaken their interest in this subject, to provide them information, to give them inspiration to help break this enormous grip that Israel's lobby has on the U.S. government. My question to Mr. Paul Finley is this, that the American nation today is on the side of Israel and therefore it is alienating itself from the Muslim world. It is also becoming Well, I'm trying to get the question across. In other words, the American nation is sacrificing itself and become an enemy of the Muslims. I would like to ask you the question, the Americans who are a, domic, who are a democratic society, how did they allow themselves to become enslaved by the thinking of a few Zionists in their country? How did they allow themselves to become enslaved in their minds? The second question is this. It, it's tied up. It's tied up with this. It's just tied up with this, and you can answer the same time. The second question is this: that Don't you think if Israel is set up for destruction, then America will also be first have to be set up for destruction, because the destruction of America will be the destruction of Israel, and Israel is destroyed. Don't you, don't you think that America is destroying itself by supporting Israel? So if Israel is set up for destruction, then similarly, America will destroy itself in the process by supporting Israel. Those are the two questions. Thank you, brother. I hope I grasp the two questions. The first, I believe, is why has the United States become the slave of the State of Israel? Does that summarize the question accurately? At the risk of trying to sell my book, that's what my book is all about. I was defeated in my bid for re-election to Congress in 1982, after having served 22 years representing a rural area, an agricultural district of the state of Illinois. 
I was defeated because I was the only member of the Congress who was challenging U.S. policy in the Middle East, that is to say, who was criticizing the support our government was giving to the State of Israel. The only one, the only one out of 535 in the U.S. Senate are 100 members, two from each state. In the House of Representatives, there are 435 members. 535 people all together. And ladies and gentlemen, as of today, there is not one of those 535 members willing to speak out for what is best for America, for what is best for humanity and unwilling to speak out to challenge the policies that our government carries out, which provides blind support to the State of Israel. Now, I could keep you here all night and explain in detail why it is that every one of these 535 elected representatives of the American people are so terrified of Israel's lobby that they dare not speak out and challenge what is going on today. One would think that given the terrible brutality that is visited every day of the year against the poor Palestinians in the occupied territory, that the American congressmen, the American senators would be lined up 50 deep every day in their chambers to speak with outrage and anguish about what was going on in the occupied territory. But you can search the congressional record which prints every word that is said in both chambers of the Congress and not find one word of criticism of Israel for its behavior. In a nutshell, it is because the American congressmen are afraid of the power of Israel's lobby. They are convinced that if they challenge the lobby, they will pay a price next election day, and politics is survival. They all want to be reelected. Now, why are they terrified? Don't they hear from their constituents who are concerned about what happens in the occupied territory? The truth is, most of the American people today are asleep. They don't know what's going on. They're worried about their own pocketbook, their own job, their own family, their own neighborhood, their own city, their taxes. They don't give much attention to what's going on in the Middle East. And they do not realize, as this gentleman's second question suggests, that the price they will ultimately pay for their blind support of Israel's military policies may be a terrible price indeed. It's eating away, it's eating away at the foundations of American democracy. Israel's lobby has been able to stifle dissent, to frighten members of Congress, to keep them from speaking out. It has also reached its arms of influence out into the universities and colleges. It has reached the business community, now only a tiny portion of the American population. Can, uh, is, is supporting the lobby for Israel in the United States. But that tiny portion of the population supports it with such zeal, zeal, such fervor, such persistence, that it is able to dominate the debate on Capitol Hill and control almost to a total degree the making of U.S. policy in the Middle East. It's a dreadful situation that threatens the cherished institutions of the United States. All that is needed is for the American people to be stir themselves, to become aware of what's happening, to know about the power of Israel's lobby, to become aware of the fact 
that they share the guilt, they share the guilt of the dreadful atrocities being perpetrated against the Palestinians every day in the year. They will then exercise their influence through the electoral process and changes will come. It's my hope that my book and the work of others in the peace field will somehow awaken the American people, create understanding in time to avert the dreadful calamity that this gentleman's second question uh, forecasts. Thank you. On the question of is the book free or should we pay for it? Please let it be known that if the price of the book has to be what it really is, then five rands would be by far insufficient. The book has been heavily subsidized by the Islamic Propagation Center of Durban and Mr. Paul Findlay doesn't make anything on it. Thank you. Next question, please. I do believe that the Jews and the Arabs have come from one seed, and that seed is Abraham. And they ought to be brothers. But the question is that they are not brothers today because they're still fighting against each other. Now, Mr. Dida uses the Holy Bible for a lot of his questions, for a lot of his answers. I would like to ask Mr. Dida to quote from the Bible, from Genesis chapter 16 and verse number 11 and 12, to answer that question. Why are the, the Jews and the, and the Arabs split? They're still fighting, still fighting and you want him to quote from and Genesis? If Mr. Didat can please use the Bible again as he normally does to give an answer for the reason why they are still fighting today. Genesis chapter 16, verses number 11 and 12. Could you read the, the statement in the Bible? This is a, the angel of the Lord which spoke to Hagar in the desert. He said, you are now with child and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. So. That's why they are still fighting today between the brothers, which are supposed to be brothers, because the Bible gives us prophecy that this will happen, that they will live in hostility towards each other. Mr. Dida have quoted from the Bible when he used the Bible. To, the question is, why are they still fighting against each other? Thank you. I think in a way you are answering the question yourself. Why are they fighting one another? That is what we want to know. We are presenting to you, said, look, they have no reason to fight. As brothers, a prophecy had been made. You talk about prophecies. In the book of Genesis chapter 17, where God Almighty promised to Abraham, he said, I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, Sorry, sorry, sorry. You're not listening. <laughs> you see, you pose the question and you're reading the letter. Now, how can you be listening to me? Somebody gave this to me. You're not right, but first it's you listen it's to it's me. I'm answering Muslim, your it's question. It's a Muslim lady that gave this to me. Okay, I'm sorry. That's all these people are waiting and you're reading the letter. Now, where, where, what do I do? Please, brother. So, a promise, prophecy, prophecy was made. God promising Abraham, I'll give you and your seed after you all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be the God. Now, the Jews are programmed, brainwashed, into thinking that they are the only sons and seeds of Abraham. Because they discount Ishmael, forgetting that in the book of Genesis, no less than 12 places, God Almighty speaks about Ishmael. 
as Ishmael, this is, as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make, a, make him a great nation, because he is thy seed. And as for Ishmael, thy son, and uh, as for Ishmael, thy seed, no less than twelve places, which the Jew ignores. If he only recognizes his own book, that look, Ishmael, as the firstborn, according to the Jewish law, he has more rights than the secondborn. And the Bible tells you that even if the child, the firstborn, is the son of a hated wife, even then you can't disinherit him. Whether you like him or you don't, he has his full inheritance. So they forget. Therefore, now this booklet of mine, you go home and you read it. It gives you all the explanation why the sickness, how the sicknesses, sicknesses develop, and what are the answers to those sicknesses. It's all given to you. Well, you then, Mr. Jira, quote, in, like in the you book. so rightfully quoted now, about the seed of Abraham. Will you then so rightfully quote what I have just quoted now? Also about Ishmael. What about Ishmael? Will you then please quote? I quoted you. You never quoted I'm quoting you, you the verses. verses. Do you know the Bible? But you didn't quote this. Chapter 17. Chapter 16. Open chapter 17 of the Bible. But will you please quote to the people chapter 16, verses 11 to 12? You read it. Now, will you please quote it to them? You've got the Bible. You use the Bible for the other questions. Why not open the Bible now? Uh, point of order. You have read, sir, you have read the quotation from the Bible, which you had the right to quote, which you did. Mr. Didot has given you even further quotations in addition to what you have read. I therefore believe that the answer that you have been to the question you've been posing has been answered by both you and the speaker. Thank you very much. All right, I will allow the gentleman in front here one more question, and then I would like to say that the lady who has posed the question appears to be a bit stage fright. I will read the question for her after your question has been answered, sir. Um, Mr. Finley. Do you believe that uh, after your discussion now about Israel um, that they set up for destruction or are they set up for destruction? Do you believe after all they have done, after all this, of, of, oh, sorry. Can I speak this through? Um, with all Israel's sin and their waywardness, from God, whom God has chosen as a chosen nation. Do you believe that God has now rejected them because of the, the sins that they are committing? Mr. I did not come here as a religious scholar in any sense. I'm not one. But I'll be glad to respond to your question. If one takes literally the words of the Old Testament, then it is very clear that the Israelites of that day were chosen of God, but chosen in the servant sense, not the leader sense. It's also easily demonstrated that the compact made with God in that period was violated by the Israelites so that any promise that God had made to them as chosen people in regard to the land was abrogated by their own violations. Could I read the question now posed by a Muslim sister? I have no idea where she is. I do not know who she expects to answer either Paul Finley or Ahmad Didat. But the question is, what role has South Africa played in the oppression of the Palestinian people? Is it here or here? This one or this one? Who, who should answer? Uh, Paul Finley, can the lady show me? This side or that side? This side, Mr. Didat. Thank you, sister. What role has South Africa played in this oppression by the Israelis of the Palestinians? The role is both are as, like Siamese twins. The Jews... 
So the, the Israelis and the South African government are like Siamese twins. See, so they are the only two nations on earth which are all both opting for the same thing, apartheid, keeping people apart, oppressing people, exploiting people. So, right. so as such now, they ought to be because South Africa has got no friends and Israel really besides the United States also has no friends. So they have to get together. I, I speak as a Christian. I asked the question of Mr. Finlay. The question was raised earlier on, why is there such a big lobby in the United States Congress against the Arab states? And my, I asked him, and I think he agrees with me, I did speak to him, it's based upon the false Christian doctrine of premillennialism, which tries to put Christ back in a fiddle on the physical throne in Jerusalem. And so the people in the United States who lobby against the Arabs are scared that they're going to blaspheme God if they don't allow this to happen. But my, my, my question to him is, is it not true that the doctrine of premillennialism is false? And in fact, in Christianity, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, bond nor free. We are all one together. Thank you for that question. One day in rural Illinois, when I was seeking re-election to Congress, a young man, a very serious young man who was then an official of the county government came to me and he said, with nothing in the way of malice in his manner, he said with greatest sincerity, I must warn you what you are saying and attempting to do in regard to the Middle East is going against God's will. You are going against God's plan, and I fear for you. And he was very serious. This man believed in the doctrine of millennialism. Yes. He also believed in biblical prophecy under which God granted to the people of Israel the right to certain land in the Middle East. He believed that the day of judgment will come and in his view the sooner the better and when that day comes there will be a great battle on the plain of Armageddon between the forces of good and evil and Christians will be raptured above the battle and be safe. And in that battle, the forces of good will triumph. And all of the Jews on earth at that moment will either be destroyed or converted instantly to Christianity. Now this young man was not an isolated figure in my district. There are thousands of people in my constituency who believe exactly as he did. And when one takes the entire nation as a whole, there are probably 40 million American citizens that hold to that doctrine. <coughs> this means that they support Israel. They want Israel to be strong until that moment of Armageddon. They believe it is their duty as Christians to give every bit of political support they can to the military strength of the state of Israel. 40 million American citizens holding to this notion of biblical prophecy that I don't believe at all. Most American Christians reject it, but still there is this enormous body of Christians who do support this idea. And they, in effect, are a part of the lobby for the State of Israel in America today. They cannot be ignored, they're difficult to reason with, but they are there and they are effective and it's part of the problem that we face. Thank 
you. That's very well. Thank you. A question to Mr. The ex-congressman Paul Findlay, please. Uh, Mr. Findlay, a quick glance at your book. I see the first edition was in 1985. You were a congressman for 22 years, which I assume was from 1960 onwards. That's correct. Right. Now, the question here is, when exactly did you start with your sort of crusade against the American aid to Israel? Was it before the 67 war or after the 67 war? The, qu the question the gentleman has posed to me is when was it that I began to speak out about Middle East policy? It happened quite by accident. One of my constituents was arrested in faraway South Yemen. He was accused of espionage by the government of South Yemen and arrested and put in prison. I had to go to South Yemen to plead for his release. And in the process, I heard for the first time the Israeli side of the problem. I heard from, uh, I should say, the Arab side of the problem. I talked to the president of, of Syria. I talked with officials in Lebanon. I talked with many officials in South Yemen. And after that experience, I began to speak out. That was in 1973, March of 1973. I have one last question. Mr. Dinat, you and Mr. Finley have now been firing up our emotions that I, and I think many others, are on the verge to go to war and defend our Muslim brothers and sisters in Palestine. Please tell us what to do. The, the question is, um, Mr. Didat and you have been firing up our emotions so that I, and I think many others, have, have been on the verge of wanting to go to war and defend our Muslim brothers and sisters in Palestine, please tell us what to do. I am not the one to tell South Africans what to do in the Middle East. I can say what I am trying to do as an American in the United States. I am trying to per persuade our Congress and our president to suspend all aid to Israel until this brutality and occupation and denial of human rights comes to an end. <laughs> U.S. aid to Israel strengthens the radicals in Israel and the sooner we put strict conditions on U.S. aid to Israel, the sooner that state will have to behave in a normal and conven hello, <laughs> in a normal and conventional fashion in its relationship with its neighbors. If U.S. aid were suspended, Israel would by necessity have to come to terms quickly with its neighbors. I am trying to advance that cause in the United States through my books and through my lectures. I would like to very be very brief in saying a great big thank you to our visiting speakers and to Mrs. Finley. A great big thank you to Mr. Dinat. And a very great big thank you to all of you for having been so patient.